director. He's worked for the US Holocaust Memorial Museum and for the Association of Jewish Refugees. He's an educator with the Holocaust Education Trust and chair of the Harwich Kinder Transport Memorial and Learning Trust. And perhaps if there's time, Mike, certainly I for one would love to know how your fundraising campaign for the memorial is, is progressing. So I think without further ado, and let me just let in one or two latecomers here, I will hand over to Mike, who will be screen sharing. And uh, yes, over to you, Mike. Thank great. you. Thank you very much, Monica. That's nice to be invited uh, here on, on a lovely day. It's World Refugee or it's World Refugee Day, I think, isn't it, today? And so it's a very appropriate, um, very appropriate day on, on which to, to give this talk. Um, as Monica rightly said, I have been involved really over the last few years in looking at uh, kinder transport, kinder transport history, and my book has just come out, the first book I've ever written that I've wanted to write. I've written books, you know, kind of ghost written books for others, but this is my first proper book, grown up book, if you like. Uh, it looks at the organisation of the kinder transport and particularly those who, those kind of what I call unsung heroes, people who, whose names have, have somehow got lost in the mist of time, uh, but deserve, I think, to be recognised for what they've done. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to race through my uh, PowerPoint slideshow here. Some of you will know what I'm going to say, probably, I'm sure, uh, in which case, uh, some apologies. Uh, for those who are not really sure about the history and the organisation of the Kinder Transport, then uh, Hopefully you might learn something today, or maybe not, we'll see. Now, I have prayed to the gods of technology who have not been that kind to me today, but let's now pray again, offering burnt offerings and all the rest of it, that you will be able to see the first slide I'm gonna put up. So let's have a little look. Has that come up? Thumbs up if you can see that. Yes, I think the old thumb has gone up. Um, so I'm calling my talk, um, as you can see, Get the Children Out, Unsung Heroes of the Kinder Transport, because it happens to be the name of the book that I recently had published. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that as we go on. And hopefully now you'll be able to see the second slide if that comes up. It's not playing. Let's have a little look. Why is it not playing? There we go. I'm sure all of you have seen the memorial at Liverpool Street Station in London called the arrival by the former kinder transportee Frank Meisler. It celebrates or commemorates the 10,000 child refugees who arrived between the 2nd of December 1938 and who left Germany on the 1st of September 1939. And it's a very moving and powerful set of images, five children looking in different directions train line is, is at their feet, suitcases, violin case, and so on and so on. And um, it's become a, an iconic part of the history of kinder transport, certainly in this country. And the Meisler statue, of course, is one of several across Europe, including Berlin, uh, Hook of Holland, Hamburg, uh, and so on. I'll come on to, as Monica kindly mentioned, the new memorial that we're going to unveil in Harwich on the 1st of September. I'll mention something about that a little bit later. So everyone knows, or a lot of people know that the Kinder Transport was a mass rescue scheme that brought nearly 10,000 children in to, into the UK. What maybe is less well known is how that organization was done, how were the children brought over here, by whom, and uh, how, was it, how was it supported and funded and so on. And that's been a, a question that's been on my mind for the last 10 years or so in Holocaust education. Now, when we think of the kinder transport rescue, I would imagine some of you somebody is not muted. Can we make sure everybody's muted, please? To be able to... Can you mute them for us? Um, is being recorded. Thank you. Uh, right, so so um, um, when we think of kinder transport rescue, rescue and, and personalities involved in that, I would imagine that the name of Sir Nicholas Winton would be foremost in your mind, and he certainly was involved in the rescue of some of the kinder transport children, well, exclusively from the uh, what was then called Czechoslovakia, from from Prague and surrounding regions. Of course, he lived on to the age of grand old age of 106. And I once asked him at an AJR event, why do you think your name 
is so well known in terms of kinder transport rescue and the others are less well known. And he said, without thinking or blinking, well, the answer is very simple. I've outlived the rest of them. Uh, he had this kind of very wry and dry sense of humor. He certainly was involved in, again, someone's, uh, someone's talking over me, I think. He certainly was involved in the rescue of children, but, but his is not the exclusive story. He, but on the other hand, he's, he's so famous that he was the subject of a, a Google Doodle. You know, the thing that goes above your Google page uh, around the world on May the 19th, 2020, in what would have been his uncle 11th birthday. And there you can see an image of the young Nicholas Winton glasses on his knees, shaking hands with the arrival of uh, refugee children, Jewish children probably, coming off a train. Where would it be? Possibly Liverpool streets, who knows? Uh, but the, the image there is very much about uh, the rescue of children and Winton uh, linked together. And of course, those of you who remember the uh, Esther Ranson That's Life programme will know that um, the fame of Nicholas Twinton really came out of the uh, programme in 1989, I think it was, in which his name became nationally known and, and celebrated, and rightly so. However, I had a kind of question. If 10,000 children, mostly Jewish, were rescued by so Nick, but by various people, and 90% came from the German Reich, the German, what was called the German Reich, then Germany and Austria. And Sir Nicholas Winton was responsible for the 6% who came from the Czech lands. Who was responsible for the other 94% of the children who came from Germany and Austria? Because Nicholas Winton was not involved in any shape, way or form with the rescue of children from Germany and Austria. His only, in fact, his, he, he focused solely, solely on Prague and the uh, Czech children, or children who had come to the Czech lands as refugees from Austria and Germany. So that was my really question. Who were the people that were, that were not Nicholas Winton uh, that rescued the 90% who came from the German lands? But let me just go back a stage and I pose a few questions. How the kinder transport began in late November 38? I think it's pretty obvious to all of us, we, 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 I don't need to emphasize this, that Kristallnacht was the, uh, what was the impetus really that got the rescue scheme going. The night of the 9th and 10th of November 38, the mass pogrom against uh, the Jewish people of Germany and Austria. And that was really the signal that Hitler and the Nazis really meant business in terms of the Jews. And actually, uh, as I say, my first point here, uh, the main stimulus, although it was the November pogroms, thousands of registrations were already in place by parents in Berlin and Vienna and so on, following the Anschluss in March 38. The, the uh, occupation of Austria by German troops led to such, de such degrading, brutal acts against the Viennese Jewish population that it was already very clear that people needed to get out and get out quick. The problem was that the governments of the around the world knew that the Jews had to leave and started then to impose visa regulations in a way that hadn't been imposed before. And so doors were actually closing as the demand for refuge was increasing. And parents throughout Germany, Austria, desperately put their ch children's names on lists in case some point in the future, trains and transports would be available to rescue them. So it's not quite true to say that it all began with Kristallnacht. Already uh, lists were being made by the German uh, Jewish organizations, which I'll come to a little bit later, uh, and names and parents were already being identified. There were, of course, desperate calls from uh, organizations in both Germany and Austria, Jewish organizations, to at least save the children. The British offer to waive visa regulations, which the, Christ the kinder transport was essentially a visa waiver scheme. And that's all it was. It was a scheme to allow children into the country without the formalities of a visa and all that meant in terms of queuing up at passport control offices and so on. 
It was partly in response to rejection of a request, in fact, in, interestingly, of 10,000 children to go to Palestine. The Zionist agencies in Germany, Austria, um, asked, uh, asked the British government to allow at least 10,000 children to go into Palestine. And for all sorts of political reasons, the British government refused that request. And you could say, some historians do say, that the, um, uh, the permissions for children to arrive in the kinder transport was a kind of alternative rescue into Britain. And of course, there were pleas from Jews and Quakers, particularly Quakers, um, around, the, around the country uh, to their local MPs, to their local councils, to the churches, uh, and of course, to the government itself. And so there was a real head of steam building up after Kristallnacht amongst well-organized groups such as the uh, chief rabbis groups, the liberal reform uh, synagogues, the Church of England through a very um, passionate request by the Archbishop of Canterbury to, for help for these Jewish children, uh, Bishop George Bell um, in Chichester and so on and so on and so on. And the Quakers played a really important part in, in that story. There was also moral outrage in the press and church circles, including that, as I've just said, of Archbishop Cosmo Lang, who went to the unusual step, as it was in those days, of making a, a newsreel broadcast in the cinemas, uh, reminding uh, people who come to the cinema that the Jewish children particularly were in great peril now in Germany and needed your financial support to help get them out and, and into safety. And also there were reassurances from the Jewish organizations, the committees and so on, that the children would not be quote a burden on the British taxpayer and would in fact only come as trans migrants, some temporary arrival that would allow them to go somewhere else in the near future. Where that somewhere else was, was a big question mark. So let me just talk to a little bit about, I wouldn't really call him a hero, but certainly is a bit on, on the unsung side, that of uh, Samuel Hoare, who was Home Secretary at the time. He was, without any doubt, a decent chap, very moral. Uh, he was from a well-known Quaker family. The Hawes were Quakers, although he wasn't particularly a practicing Quaker, but he, he'd come with a very strong moral education and background. He'd also come uh, on the distaff side with, his, with a history of supporting Neville Chamberlain's Munich agreements and was later in 1940 in fact branded by Michael Foote and others as one of the guilty men of, of the appeasers. But here he plays a very significant role because a delegation of Jews and Quakers go to Samuel Hoare um, to ask if children, at least children, could be brought to Britain without going through the slow, laborious process of the visa. And on the 21st of November 1938, just uh, 10 days or so after November pogroms in Germany, Hall makes a statement to the House of Commons. And here is some of the highlights of the statement. It was a statement, this wasn't as some books say, um, a request to pass a new law or uh, it wasn't a government bill or a white paper. It was a statement to the House saying that Jewish children and those persecuted by the Nazis would be allowed into the country. But he does remind uh, members of parliament that he has to avoid anything in the nature of mass immigration, which might lead to anti-Semitic uh, outbursts. So this was not going to be a mass rescue involving the parents. He emphasized that the arrival of the children would be very temporary, that they would go somewhere else when, when the time was right, and that they could come without doing any harm to the British population. Whatever that harm might be, the newspapers who were against these immigrations and so on, uh, there were newspapers called the Daily Mail and Daily Express in particular, um, that the narrative was being developed that some of these older refugee children might take your jobs, they might reduce wages, and who knows, some of them might be fifth columnists as well. And he tells Parliament that uh, a voluntary committee would be prepared to bring over here all the children whose maintenance could be guaranteed either by their funds or by generous individuals. In other words, that the whole funding of the children, which would be millions, even in 1938 prices, 
would be done privately, not by the government of the taxpayer. And with all those caveats in place, he finishes off with a Quaker style flourish, saying that by doing the things that are morally right, we shall achieve something which is worthy of the name of the British nation. And in fact, in that debate, which I do recommend you to look at in Hansard, there were no, I don't think there were any voices of dissent. There were some curious voices about how this might work and who would, who would pay for it and so on, but no uh, members of parliament dissented from this announcement. And sure enough, within a few days of the announcement, the first kinder transport children uh, arrived. So how did they get here and, and who was responsible? Well, let me just uh, pick out some of the names that I've mentioned or talked about in, in the book. I'm gonna begin with Helen Bentwich. Helen Bentwich, as you can see here from the portraits, was a member of a very distinguished, distinguished Anglo-Jewish family, the Bentwiches. Her husband, well, she was a Franklin, actually. She was born a Franklin. That's a, she was an aunt of Rosalind Franklin, the DNA scientist. And she married Norman Bentwich, who had been, who had been Attorney General in Palestine, in Mandate Palestine in the 1920s. But here in the portrait painted off her, she wears a um, in, insignia around her neck, which was that of a the chairman of the London County Council Education Board. So she was a very um, influential educator. And she was one of the first people to realize that the children, at least the children had to be rescued from what was very clearly now mortal danger. There was no doubt the Nazis meant business. And that she set up with others, the movement for the care of children from Germany, which was the major, the main sort of state, the main refugee committee uh, that organized the rescue from, the, uh, from Germany and Austria, not from the Czech lands at all. That was a separate body. She put together, uh, Helen Bentwich, uh, a really formidable team, uh, mostly of women, not all, but mostly of women who made up this movement for the care of children from Germany, later called the Refugee Children's Movement. And I'll just highlight one or two of the women that she brought in as uh, fellow members of the committee. Lola Har Warburg, there on the bottom left, was a member of the Warburg banking family, herself uh, an exile from Germany. In fact, she'd, she was on a Gestapo hit list and got out in time before she'd been arrested. Um, but she was incredibly well connected, as you can imagine. Uh, she'd been working for years with the Jewish agencies in Germany to help children and adults out to Palestine. So she was very well connected. She knew everyone that had to be known. And it was Lola Hahn Warburg who did the bulk really of the liaising between the London Committee the MCCG and the various Jewish agencies in um, Germany and Austria, the ones in Berlin, the ones in Vienna, and so on. So a lot of the nitty gritty organization of the children, who was going to come, when they were going to come, were they fit to come, were they healthy, were they not healthy, uh, who would look after them once they were here, that was really headed by Lola Hahn Warburg. Assisted by Lane Blonde, who was born Elaine Marx, one of the Marx family of Marx and Spencer. Again, a very formidable member of an Anglo-Jewish world and an incredible by all accounts, in fact, by her own accounts, in fact, a, a very well-organized lady who got things moving, as did Stella Isaacs, who a few months after the formation of the committee went on to found the Women's Voluntary Service, the RWVS, as it now is, um, I think they might have dropped the woman's bit. Anyway, the voluntary service, uh, which uh, was such a mainstay during the Second World War. And Rebecca Seif, who was also a member of the Marx family, another sister of uh, Simon Marx. So she put together uh, a considerably powerful team of volunteers, none of them paid, to help to organise these early transports, particularly from Germany uh, and Vienna from Austria. So let's have a look at some of the people at the other end of the spectrum, uh, the continental spectrum, Gertrude Weissmuller Meyer. She's a Dutch rescuer, she was a Dutch rescuer. And as you can see from the uh, very happy picture here, she's standing next to a bust uh, of her commemorated in her native Holland. She's a recipient of the Yad Vashem Righteous Among Nations because of her outstanding 
work in rescuing children. When it came to negotiating with the Nazis, it was felt not safe, quite rightly, for the British committee under Helen Bentwich to go out to Germany or Austria and negotiate the release of the children. And so they sent Gertrude as a go-between, if you like, to negotiate. And negotiate she did. She flew uh, to Vienna in early December 1938. And there she met the head of what was called the, Jew the, Jew the Jewish Emigration Office. Uh, the senior Nazi in charge of that emigration office is here. That face may look familiar the infamous face of Adolf Eichmann, who in 1938 was in charge of Jewish emigration, so-called. Well, as I say in the book, the whole encounter between Gertrude and Eichmann is as good as any Hollywood film could imagine. As she lands in Vienna, she's immediately arrested by the local Gestapo, who thinks she's a spy. She demands to be released, you know, mentioning all sorts of high-powered Nazis who would get them in trouble. She is released and is put before Eichmann in his gigantic office, stolen from the Rothschilds and surrounded by an Alsatian dog or two. And his very cynical view of her didn't really believe that any Aryan lady like her should waste their time trying to save Jews. She gave back more or less as good as she got. So I've got the transcript of her own account of what happened uh, uh, in the book. But suffice to say, that she wasn't going to be intimidated by this man. And um, Eichmann ended his um, interview with her by saying, um, and it was something like this, let's have a prank, that's the kind of man he was, let's have a prank. If you can get 600 children out of Vienna by the end of this week, then I will let 10,000 go. So with that enormous challenge, Weissmuller went and worked with the Jewish agencies in Vienna, the IKG. Um, and by the end of the week, they managed to get 600 children on the first transport out of Vienna. 600 children on one transport. That was the largest single transport of any of the kinder transport history. 100 stay in Holland and 500 of them come to uh, Britain, to England, landing at Harwich, some of them sent to Dovercourt camp, some to Pakefield camp and others to uh, various training camps and hostels. But I just wanted to emphasise 600, the largest single transport organised and all thanks to Gertrude and the Viennese Jews. And yet her name is hardly known. Um, Nicholas Winton, God bless him, wonderful work, rescued 669 over several months. And this was just the beginning for Gertrude as she continued to organise the transports, particularly out of Vienna. Uh, and then during the war, she became a very active member of the Dutch underground resistance, finding safe houses for Jewish families throughout the whole of Holland. And in fact, um, there's the ship, a ship called the, uh, the MV Bordegraven, which was the very last ship to leave Holland on the day that it was invaded by the Nazis in May 1940. And she managed to get, again, Hollywood couldn't get this right, she managed to get 70 plus children from a Jewish orphanage in Amsterdam on that ship as it was being stri um, strifed, is that the right word? Strafed by the Luftwaffe. But the children managed to get on the ship and the ship sail eventually it took five days to get them to safety in Liverpool. Um, she refused to get on board, even though people pleaded with her to uh, escape herself. But no, she said, I'm going back to try and get more. Sadly, of course, all the ports were closed after this and Gertrude couldn't get any more out. And I have, I can't show it to you now, but a documentary film made recently by Pamela Storhoft about uh, Gertrude has a remarkably rare interview with Gertrude in the 1960s for Dutch TV, in which tearfully, tearfully, she recounts that day when she got the children on board the ship saying, and I quote, if only I had more help, if only I had more buses, I could have got more, I could have got more, tears flowing down her cheeks as an old lady remembering 
not the triumph of saving the children, but the tragedy of those that she, could, that she didn't save. So I make it very clear in my book that she's definitely one of my unsung heroes and most remarkable figure. And we're talking now about particularly uh, Jewish children from Vienna. Going back to Berlin, um, I'm sure some of you or many of you may, will have heard of Wilfred Israel, who was the leader of uh, two of the major Jewish agencies in, in Germany, the Reichsvertretung and the Hilfsverein. Uh, but he was also, uh, he, uh, Wilfred Israel, whose biography has been very well written by Naomi Shepherd, I do recommend that book, was uh, another I'm very important go between. Is how to connect with the um, predominantly ethnic. Again. Um, he was another go between uh, uh, because partly he was a um, Anglo Anglo German. He had a British passport and was able to move a little bit more freely in Germany to help organise the transports out of Germany. But he was part of a much larger team. Again, interestingly, of mostly women including Katha Rosenheim, who was head of the Department of Children's Emigration in the Rice of Tretung. And it's thought that she and her staff would have saved over 7,000 Jewish lives um, escaping Nazi Germany, not just to England, but to Palestine, to other countries as well. And she was very much the, the um, leading light of the Berlin and German kinder transport um, end of the, of the organization, as was the next lady, Hannah Kaminsky, who headed the League of Jewish Women, the Jüdische Frauenbund, um, and not just in terms of organizing the transports, but she played an incredibly important role as a chaperone, bringing the children, the young children, the youngest of the children, out of Germany through Holland, across the sea to Harwich and so on. She would sit holding their hands or ensuring that they were as happy as they could be, given that they just said farewell to their parents. Interestingly, both, um, not, I mean, not interestingly, but tragically, uh, both Hannah Kaminsky and uh, Kate Rosenham and many of the other women who helped them uh, were murdered by the Nazis. Now you can see that dreadful 1942 date, which often uh, send, send, always sends shivers down my spine when I see that as a date of death. She was in fact murdered at Auschwitz. And again, a name that, although she was briefly remembered in a room, I think in London, Hannah Kaminsky is somebody that ought to be remembered properly. Um, as, as, as was Bertha Bracey, who was General Secretary of the Society of Friends, a Quaker, the leading Quaker, in fact, if there is such a thing, Quakers are very uh, democratic, but she was the leading figure in the 1930s of the Quaker movement. And uh, it was she that led a delegation to Samuel Hoare to insist that the children, at least the children, be let out. She was a good friend of Wilfred Israel and was forever hopping across between London and Berlin to help sort out and organize the German-Austrian transports, particularly the German ones, using also some of the Quakers in Germany, very small numbers, uh, at local level to liaise with Jewish parents in some of the smaller towns and cities uh, around Germany. When war broke out, Bertha Bracey continued her work helping the refugees who were already in England into safety. And you may know the Quakers played a huge role in finding foster homes, in finding schools, boarding schools, training establishments, um, and so on. And Bertha Bracey was the leading figure behind that Quaker movement. She was always touring the country, insisting on her, um, on her friends' houses that they do something to help their local refugees who may have arrived in your town or village. So again, a most remarkable figure. And I don't know if you, any of you saw that wonderful documentary film called uh, The Windermere Children, about the rescue of uh, surviving children from the camps in 1945. And they were brought to to Windermere for, to recuperate. There's a wonderful documentary made, sorry, a play, a filmed play made a year ago by BBC, I think. Um, anyway, what he didn't say in the film was that Bertha Bracey was the, uh, uh, one of the main instigators along with Leonard Montefiore of the uh, Windermere rescue. Leonard Montefiore is also in her book, as is Bertha Bracey. So she plays an incredibly important role 
uh, in the rescue of Jewish refugees, both before, during, and even after the war as well. I do have a recording of Bertha, but I don't have time to play it, I'm afraid. I have to have a lot, another session when I've got a little more time. So what, do we send them in to you or for... And then, um, I want to keep... One or two, please, please, if you can. One or two unexpected uh, heroes, Alan Sainsbury, seen here on the right. Alan Sainsbury, who was in 1938 the leader, the, the chair of the Sainsbury group, the group, who, who um, also did uh, acts of what I would call um, unsung heroism, in that he was so incensed by what he heard about Kristallnacht that he and his brother Robert Sainsbury decided to found a hostel in Putney in South London and pay for and guarantee throughout the war period uh, for 25 boys and girls to come uh, from Germany, Jewish boys and girls, to live in the Sainsbury hostel, the Sainsbury house. And this photograph, which uh, was given to me by one of the uh, survivors, is of apparently is of one of the former kind now grown up, presenting Alan Sainsbury with a drawing of one of his historic stores. And Sainsbury stayed in touch actually with all of the, uh, all of the refugee boys and girls, you know, sending them bar mitzvah presents, sending them wedding presents, um, keeping in touch to make sure they were okay. Um, even helping some of them get to Israel in 1948 um, and, and lobbying various groups to get them visas or to get them whatever it might be. So again, I've got a chapter on Alan Sainsbury, the grocer who did a remarkable thing, as many other people did as well. As did Frank Bond. Frank Bond was the manager of the Dovercourt Bay holiday camp. Some of you may remember holiday camps uh, like Pontins and Butlins. This one was owned by Warners uh, in Dovercourt Bay, which was two miles away from the Harwich Quayside. And Helen Bentwich had the very clever idea of renting the Dovercourt Bay holiday camp as a refugee transit camp. It was two miles away from the port where they arrived and I, I, I think that over 1500 children, Jewish children, spent their first weeks and months at the Dovercourt camp. The manager of the Dovercourt camp was a man called Frank Bond who volunteered unpaid to stay on through the winter months to look after the camp and the children. Um, and there are mar marvellous stories of Frank Bond and his wife taking the children to see Snow White and the Seven Dwarves and providing them with free ice creams. Um, you know, little things, but very important to those children to, to feel at home. He also put on a whole programme of entertainments for them to take their mind off the terrible trauma of what was going on with their parents and brothers and sisters back in Germany. Um, so Bond, again, in a, in a, perhaps in a small way, but certainly a significant way, the, the, the person that ran the Dovercourt Bay camp, uh, I thought needed to be at least remembered. And in fact, when the children, uh, when the camp closed in the end of March 39, a huge postcard was created by the remaining refugees, boys at this point, uh, thanking Frank Bond and his wife for all that they'd done for them. And you can see that card in the Jewish Museum in Camden to Mr. and Mrs. Bond, it says. And that's what got me interested in who was he? Uh, and I tell the story more fully. Um, I'm going to move on a little bit because I'm just aware of, of the time um, uh, running out a little bit. But um, this is uh, Mary Hughes, who is or was the chair of the um, York Hospitality Committee. She was a Quaker and a friend of Bertha Bracey. And she was telephoned by her son, David, who was an 18 year old undergraduate who had volunteered to run the post office at the Dover Court camp. I met David Hughes into, well into his nineties and he told me the stories of the sad children sending postcards off, letters off to their mothers and fathers in Germany and the anxious look on their faces as a letter would arrive at the camp uh, from them. But in my story here, David uh, Hughes finds or looks, spots two young children who are very sad, they, they're crying, and they're crying because they've been sent to a very, very unhappy foster family somewhere in the Southwest. David takes them under his wing and phones his mum, 
Mary and says, you've got two very unhappy children here. Is there any way that you can take them? And she says, put them on the next train. Those two children go up to York and spend the rest of their lives, essentially, as children of Mary Hughes. Mary and Mr. Hughes as well, John Hughes. So she saves the lives or she saves the, you know, the, the um, she saves in lots of different ways the lives of those two children. Uh, and she's one of many, of course. And I try to pay tributes in the book to some of the foster families who did what they could and were as kind as they could be and sometimes going out of their way. When Mary discovered that their mother, the child's mother, was still in Germany in a lot of danger, she immediately went down to the Home Office to arrange a visa to be given to uh, the mother to come as a domestic servant to the Hughes family. And come she did, although I don't think she did any domestic service, she lived with the, uh, with the family for many years. Um, and uh, I, didn't, I think she died relatively shortly after the war, but the, the children were reunited with their mum, uh, thanks to Mary. So again, very much a, an unsung hero, I think. And I'm gonna finish off with a, a name that you probably know, Rabbi Solomon Schoenfeld. He was a... What we would now call an ultra-Orthodox um, rabbi. From, uh, somebody's talking over me again. An ultra-Orthodox rabbi from um, a North London uh, community, born but in England in 1912, and apparently, you know, very much an uh, Englishman. He loved cricket, he loved Gilbert and Sullivan, spoke with an impeccably English accent. And because of that, and maybe only because of that, he was very much welcomed into the clutches of the Home Office, who thought he was a good chap. Schoenfeld's passion was to rescue the Orthodox children of Germany and Austria. He, not for him, the Helen Bentwich's committees, uh, but for him, his own Schoenfeld kinder transports. And it's thought that he probably brought out about 700 children from, uh, particularly from, from Vienna actually, but not just children, he brought out um, uh, yeshiva scholars, uh, rabbinical scholars, rabbis, their families and so on. Maybe about 3000 were saved uh, through the visa uh, work of Schoenfeld, sometimes with his friends in the home office, staying up all night to write out as many visas as they could. Uh, Schoenfeld was the arch chutzpah dick man. He would do anything to help save the Jews of Germany and Austria. Uh, and you can see here that he's wearing an army uniform. Which, which, which regiment do you think he's in? Well, the answer is he's in the regiment of Rabbi Schoenfeld. It was a made up uniform, which he thought rightly would open many doors if people thought he was a senior military figure and not just a rabbi. And so thanks to that, he could open doors, walk into embassies, walk into consular offices, and after the war, um, helped to rescue many, many surviving Jewish boys and girls, even for instance, at one point, hiring a ship to bring hundreds of children over uh, to, to England. So although his name is relatively well known, I wanted to try and tell as much of the story as I could about Rabbi Solomon Schoenfeld. Again, I could go on and on because uh, it, it's an amazingly colorful character. But towards the end of his life, his son told me this, Towards the end of his life, he was recorded on, uh, on tape in the 80s. And somebody says to him on the tape, you did an amazing job during before and during the war of saving these children. You did a wonderful job. And he says, this old man's voice comes out of the tape saying, you know, I could have done more. I could have done more. So I wanted to, to, uh, to, to commemorate and praise uh, Rabbi Schoenfeld. Now, that's come to the end of my unsung heroes. Of course, I've got many more in the book, but, but apart from buying my book, which I hope you do, I, I, I hope you can also maybe help with some research I'm doing for the US Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington. We're trying to find surviving British families, British families who took in kinder. They'd have to be living eyewitnesses in their mid eighties or nineties. They would be foster siblings, if you like, brothers and sisters of the kinder. And the aim is then to film them, with their permission, of course, so that it forms part of a new archive that the Washington Museum is putting together. 
Um, so I'm not looking for surviving kinder, but for the families who took them in. So if you have any information about that, please through Monica, uh, do get in touch or you can get in touch on that email address actually that you can see there. And I'm not going to show you that because I've not got time, mm. but uh, there's my book. It was published in February uh, 2022. And um, I tell a lot of the stories that I've been telling you today. And then finally, just finishing off with uh, to say that the Kinder Transport Memorial in Harwich is going to be unveiled on the 1st of September. We have raised all the funds we need for it, which is fantastic. Uh, and it will be unveiled on at three o'clock on the afternoon of the 1st of September, the, the commemorative day when the last kinder transport left uh, Germany. Um, it will be, I think, a very moving day. We've got Dame Stephanie Shirley to give the kind of keynote speech. And it's part of a trail of other things, other memorials and information boards around the town that will be revealed at the same time. And uh, the image, by the way, is of four or five children descending a ship's gangplank. Because we wanted to have the maritime part of the story in the kinder transport narrative. So that's if you have been listening, as they used to say. Thank you. Uh, and now I think we've got a time for a few questions, probably. Uh, if I could ask you to make the questions relatively brief, and if I could also urge you not to make a statement or um, you know, to, somebody said please don't ask a speech. But if you've got some genuine questions, I'd be very pleased to answer them. Thank you very much, Mike. That was hugely engaging as I fully expected. Very, very interesting indeed. And so much more that you could have said. And indeed there are many more wonderful people play, paid tribute to in, in your book. And I should say straight away that the book is available. It's actually very reasonable anyway, but the publishers have very kindly offered it at a, um, <clears throat> a further reduction of 40%, which is hugely generous. And what I will do is send a follow-up email to everyone, giving you the discount code, etc., cetera, et cetera. Um, Let me also say before I forget that very important Importantly, also, and Mike's already mentioned World Refugee Week, this is the beginning also of UK, sorry, World Refugee Day and UK Refugee Week, that one pound of the proceeds of every sale of his wonderful book go to the charity Safe Passage. And if you don't know about them, let me just tell you a little bit more. Essentially, it does fabulous work in helping unaccompanied, you can probably guess, child refugees find legal routes to sanctuary to this country, I think, exclusively am I all right I think certainly the focus is yeah. on the UK as they put it themselves every year thousands of child refugees arrive in Europe almost half of them are unaccompanied and as a result are at risk of being abused and trafficked yet many of these children have a legal right and this is important to travel safely to a place of sanctuary and this is what you know safe passage helps them to do so I would urge you buy the book whatever you pay just just buy it um now we do have a little bit of time um I haven't seen any questions coming in. It's not a huge group. If anybody would rather just raise a virtual hand, uh, or indeed even a physical hand, if you put your camera on and say what you have to say out loud, you're very welcome. Um, perhaps I can set the ball rolling by asking what's perhaps a an uncomfortable question, Mike, which you, I think, perhaps quite tactfully or diplomatically chose not to mention in relation to Rabbi Schoenfeld. And that is that he did have quite a lot of um, well, there was tension, should we put it again quite politely, between him, the rabbi, who felt very strongly that actually Jewish children should go to Jewish homes, even if they weren't, in fact, orthodox. And the more, what should we say, the liberal sort of branch, if you like, of the Jewish um, helpers who felt, well, actually, it was more important that they should be saved, whatever. Now, you can probably tell from what I, the way I put it, where my sympathy slide. But I wonder if you'd like to say a little bit more about that, because it's a kind of slightly thorny problem, isn't it? It is actually, it was one that uh, Schoenfeld uh, certainly made no friends amongst the uh, various refugee committees uh, at the children's, you know, Helen Bentwich's committees or the kind of the, the overarching umbrella committee led by Otto Schiff. He was seen as a bit of a maverick, a bit of a bad boy um, by them and causing trouble and strife. But his view, which he of course felt very passionately about, was that there's no point in saving Jewish lives if you if you're going to uh, expose them to the loss of their Jewish identity and Jewish culture. And for instance, he called the, he, he brought out a pamphlet in 1944, which absolutely enraged everybody on the opposite side. The, um, you know, the committee that Helen started was, became known as the Refugee Children's Committee. 
and uh, he brought out a pamphlet mm. sad, sad, sarcastically calling it the Refugee Estrangement Committee um, or Refugee Estrangement Movement. Um, so he felt very passionately that really only Jewish uh, uh, families should take in these Jewish children. The problem was that A, the, there was very much the need to get the children out as quickly as possible. Everyone knew that time was not on the side of, uh, of the rescuers, you know, following Kristallnacht, of course. Uh, but also, for reasons that are really difficult to explain, the number of um, uh, Jewish uh, families offering uh, accommodation was, was limited. Um, for reasons, again, no one really knows the answer to this one. No one's done any real in-depth study of it. But it was certainly the case, and Schoenfeld also knew this, that there were not enough Jewish families coming forward to, um, to offer their, their homes. So yeah, it, it, but it was a source of constant tension between Schoenfeld, uh, the chief rabbi, who was his father-in-law, by the way, uh, and the refugee committees, who said, look, we're doing what we can. We, for instance, they, 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 were, they, they laid down very distinct rules that the children were, were not to be proselytized uh, forcibly, that Jewish education had to be provided at some level, and that might have meant, for instance, sending pamphlets uh, about Shavuot or Yom Kippur or something, and where possible, visiting rabbis would try and visit the children in their homes. But there's no doubt about it, I don't think anyone's got any stats on it, that there was quite a considerable number of conversions into into the Christian world uh, by the by the children. In some cases where I've interviewed fa English families where that did take place, they've often said, well, it wasn't, a, we weren't missionaries, but going to church on a Sunday is just something that we did. Mm -hmm. And we didn't want to, we didn't want Uta or little Carl to feel left out. But of course, once they started going to church and not synagogue, they were kind of drawn in. I think, uh, so does that answer your question? But certainly there was a huge amount of tension and absolutely no love lost between Schoenfeld, uh, Schiff, Bentwiches and so on, who thought he was just a troublemaker. It's a very complicated issue and sort of in a way unresolvable, but I think it does bring up this bigger question that I always, when I teach mostly indeed about the arts, but I often show that statue of the, you know, the Liverpool Street, uh, my little statue that you, you began with, you know, it does paint a rather, rosy or rose tinted image doesn't it of this whole project yeah. of rescue and I think your book also although clearly I don't for a moment sort of deny you know that people who did good should should be fully acknowledged and there are many you haven't actually had a chance to mention by name there is perhaps a danger isn't there of perhaps underplaying or slightly shoving under the carpet some of the tensions not just the one we just touched you know, touched on but but you know others besides that actually make it a much more complex yeah definitely I mean, I mean one of the stories I tell in the book is that of and this 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 must have happened on a much larger scale that of children who had been abused or had gone to very unhappy mm -hmm. families who had been either rescued into going into a hostel or into another family English family that were much kinder to them um, so again, there was a, a broad gamut really of uh, responses. There was certainly a case, and there were, I've even come across uh, memoirs where Jewish families took in older, uh, you know, older children, say 15, 16 year olds, to become skivvies, you know, to become unpaid mm -hmm. household uh, servants uh, or to run the shop. Uh, one example I was given uh, by, by one of my interviewees, you know, she was brought over to help run the shop. Uh, well, that's good or bad, I don't know, but certainly it was a mixed picture. Uh, I'm obviously keen in the in the book to look to the positives, but I don't balk, you know, I don't flinch from saying that these people were remarkable, and because they're remarkable, there are not many of them, probably. Um, but yeah. Good, we've got uh, one question just come in. Um, yeah. Okay, was, was there any organised support for the kinder to help settle into life in Britain? E.g. language, you can probably see language different food, etc. Or is this a responsibility of the fostering family? It depended where you were, really. There, there, there were a very well organised refugee committees in some places. I'm in Cambridge now, for instance, and the local committee here was extremely well organised and would, in fact, provide language lessons, uh, a social club, a kosher canteen, 
films, um, discussion groups, even an, even an amateur operatic group made up of the kinder, you know, to sing in German, uh, some of their, um, you know, the, 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 uh, the repertoire. And then there were other places that did nothing, you know, couldn't do anything or didn't know how to do anything. Um, but certainly, you know, where there was a well-organized refugee committee, they did their best, you know, to provide all those things. There were, for instance, there was a refugee committee, I think, uh, in, I can't quite remember where, but I think in, in North London, I think it was, uh, that provided free, regular free English lessons, you know, taught by trained teachers uh, to, to the, to the uh, refugees, not just the children, but older refugees as well. So there were, certainly were, uh, there was certainly infrastructure of support in place where the refugee committees were well organised and where they weren't, uh, there was nothing. I mean, I, again, some of my interviewees have said, you know, I went, I was sent out to the, into the depths of Suffolk, you know, there's not no, no Jews anywhere nearby, I didn't know anybody, couldn't speak very good English, nobody spoke any German, and I felt more alone than I've ever felt in my life. Mm -hmm. So it was a range of, like everything else, it was a range of experiences. Thank you. Uh, Marjorie, Marjorie Dunwood has something she'd like to ask. Sure. Um, thank you very much. Very interesting talk, indeed. Thanks. One of great interest to me. Um, I, I, I haven't, unfortunately, got the immediate knowledge in front of me at the moment, but I suspect Morley College in London um, had an input into helping um, with language and also other things like music, et cetera, for, for the Jewish children. Um, and it might be worth looking at that. And I think at that time, uh, Morley College was run by a Jewish lady. Well, thank you that. You've opened the door for me there. I didn't know I about think, college. But I'm that's sorry, I wish I'd got the information in front of me to give you the exact thing, but I'll get in touch with you about that. Thank you. Yes, where, where, well, was, where was it exactly? Where well, college is not, not far from where you are, isn't it? It was founded by Gustav Holst and, and that. Um, Belsize Square around... Uh, okay, Belsize Square, uh, right, okay. Uh, yeah. That's certainly well, it, it's still going to this day. It okay, is a working man. Yeah, and of course the, the 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 answer I always love to hear is yes, we have an archive. I don't know, but uh, but I can certainly awesome. give you. I can pass on some information. Thank you. Yes, that's great. Thank yeah. you. That's just for the well, record, certainly we've, we've, here in here in Cambridge. I just give you an example. There was um, uh, the Cambridge Technical School, which was for boys over fourteen, school leaving age, um, to uh, help them train in in crafts, you know, carpentry and uh, metalwork and so on. Uh, and they they provided free places for certainly um, I, I I know of six or seven uh, Jewish refugee boys who were in the in the city, and yeah. so this is these, the idea of colleges and schools providing free places was not uncommon. Yes, apprenticeships, you see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I can just chip in there by saying that I've come across Morley College in a more in a musical context that actually yeah. I know that um, I think Michael Tippett was actually associated with the music department there and there's some really interesting well, connections on, on the cultural okay. side. Um, Marjorie, can I just embarrass you ever so slightly by saying that Marjorie, I'm hoping, is going to give a talk for us later this year because she's done yeah. some wonderful research on uh, Kurt Hahn, who of course was not of course, but who was the brother-in-law of Lola Hahn Warburg -Wur -Wur and uh, other people besides, so we're going to have a session hopefully on, on the schools. But uh, Marjorie, I don't know if you want to just quickly say a little bit more about Lola to kind of add to this rich mix that we're hearing about today? Or well, would you she, like um, I remember her during her last year, she came to visit us at the school. She was um, a very powerful lady. And I mean powerful in the finest sense of the word. And right up until the end of her life, she continued to support all refugeeism and did a lot of very good hard grafting. Um, was it the Bosnian War refugees, etc.? She she continued to work with refugees throughout her life and um, put money in that direction. Um, she there is a book written about her, which I think you might. I saw that you got the photograph off the cover of that. Um, a lot of her papers, I think, are trying to find a home at the moment. And, oh, that's, yeah. That um, so I think, I, I hope that they've reached the um, Vena Library in London and also some papers from somebody else. Uh, but I can get more information on that. That would be, that would be incredibly exciting. I'm sure, like, you know, in a programme like this, that we, we've got the facts right. <laughs> 
yes. Absolutely. So you think they've gone to the Vena Library? I hope so, yes. Mm. Yeah. That would, be, that, would be, that would be amazing. I know that she was, she sent a letter of, um, you know, goodwill to the very first kinder transport oh, reunion. There are some very young people. Oh, can we please make sure that you're muted? This is actually rather impolite. I wasn't as interested because I felt like they were older. And I think what interested me about this group of people were. Yeah, very good. Her work with the um, her work with the Windermere boys was was well known. In the background, she was, but she was certainly a very strong influence there. Mm. She was a strong influence in setting up a sanatorium in Kent for children with TB, and again, always linked with the Quaker movement. Mm. The Quakers <laughs> crop up again and again and again. <laughs> And while she was going back and to, to Berlin to sort out things, uh, to organise this, this thing with the kinder transport, um, the Quakers, that, the, the British Quakers that were in Berlin were working in the background like anything. Um, and again, I haven't got you know, enough facts in front of me at this moment to give you, but I cannot underestimate her work and all of the ladies that you've mentioned today, I mean, the, the amount of work they did in the background was phenomenal. It's a phenomenal task, this. One of the, one of the ladies I didn't mention, uh, because I hadn't, really couldn't find out very much about her, and her name's just gone out of my head, it'll come back in a minute, uh, was also a German emigre, came out more or less the same time as Lola did. Uh, and um, it, when she was in Germany, she had been the representative of Thomas Cook um, in oh. Berlin. Now, who would you want on your committee, you know, to uh, help organise the transports and what some of that kind of experience? I'll have to look it up. I'm really sorry. I'll put the two of you in touch with each other. Can in I touch, just yeah. pick up on two things there, if I, if I may? One is that it struck me actually with so many of these rather tantalisingly short, you know, narratives you gave of each of these people that actually so many of them went on to do sure. remarkably philanthropic, yeah. warm-hearted yes, yes, things, you know, yes. beyond beyond the war. But also the question of gender. I mean, I'm interested that you use the word heroes. It seems to me that actually heroines might be a more uh, well, okay, so that's a moot point in terms of terminology. But, you know, what about this question of gender? Is it just very obviously that women... Well, I'll leave it to you. You, you answer the question about why, why so many women. I, it's hard to say, really. Yeah. It's, um, it, 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 it probably is, it's as much as anything, to do with their status. Um, for instance, here in, here in Cambridge, where I, I've done a particular in-depth study of the Cambridge Refugee Committee, um, they the vast majority were wives of academics mm. and therefore they had time they had the they had influence they had they had money uh, they had contacts in a way that their husbands didn't have so that's certainly what it was here in Cambridge whether that was replicated elsewhere is is a moot point but it's it certainly seems that Although there were men involved, uh, I talk about uh, Wyndham Deeds, for instance, was a very, very important man in the uh, kinder transport story. You know, Brigadier General Wyndham Deeds, a rem remarkable character. Um, but it, you're right; it was it was mainly women, and they. I think it's something to do with their social position, their social status, their ability to be a bit more flexible in terms of what they were able to do. You know, they had a little bit more time on their hands because in those days, working women was quite a rarity amongst the middle classes, particularly. Mm -hmm. So that might that might help explain. I'm looking at the clock. Um, yeah, I'm looking at the clock. We should probably well, begin. Uh, we don't have to stop on the dot. <laughs> in fact, we've already gone over seven o'clock. We've got a lovely comment here from somebody called Rose. Um, yes, can you see? We, we discovered in 1989 uh, the 50th anniversary. Okay. Um, of the kinder transport when, when there was a large gathering in London that our home in Hampstead had been donated and used as a hostel for kinder with the Jewish warden with his wife and baby, the Sunshine Home, with about 20 children living there. We kept in touch with a lady who turned up at our door who lived in Israel for the rest of her life. Where exactly is it? Rose, would you like to make yourself visible and tell us a little bit more? Where, where was it? Rose, would you like to turn uh, on your camera? I won't put the camera on, but I'm here. Oh, okay. Um, yes. It was a wet day and someone knocked on our door and she turned out to be a lovely lady called Rivka who had lived here and got out of, uh, went, left this country at the end of the war, eventually rediscovered her mother 
and they lived in Israel for the rest of their lives. And we visited them in Israel and stayed uh, and, and stayed in touch. But she took, we went round the house. It's now in flats, but it, it was then one building. And she, she looked in the different rooms and she said, oh, this was the girls' dormitory. There was 10 of us here. And when the uh, air raids went, we hid in the cupboards. We were so terrified. And they went to local schools and then she, she left school and she trained uh, in, in this country before she, uh, when she was about 17. Uh, but after that, from time to time, there would be a knock on the door and it would be someone else saying, we used to live in this house. So it was a very strange feeling for her and us, mm -hmm. very emotional, because here we are, a Jewish family. And when she left um, Frankfurt, she was 10. And when she first arrived here, our daughter was 10. Mm -hmm. And it was, she came to the, our daughter's school and spoke there about what it was like during the war as a refugee. So she said the people in the local school were not friendly. She didn't like it mm. uh, because she was foreign. So, yeah. Did you know about this particular hostel, Mike? Because one of my other questions would be, is there still a lot more to find out? You know, are there certain individuals? There is a huge amount yeah. still to find. I mean, it's enormous. So you think 10,000 children had to go somewhere um, that's not to say 10,000 families, but certainly thousands of destinations and often four or five in each child might be moved three or four times mm -hmm. through the war period. So there is a huge, I didn't know about this. I'm just looking it up now actually on my laptop. Can I just add, she gave us, she showed us some photographs uh, of it at the time and when they had a sukkah in the garden and things like that. So it was right. definitely Jewish um, you know, yeah, apparently, the, apparently there was a privately printed book called No Longer a Stranger. That's right. And edited I got by it. Inga Sedan. Um, I'm just yeah, going through my that. laptop now. So, yes, it's, uh, I know a little bit about it, but again, top of my head, I can't just, yeah, I mean, there's a vast amount still to do. Absolutely. One could write uh, second and third and fourth and fifth mm -hmm. volumes, I'm sure, if I had time, but haven't. Uh, but yes, there, there's a lot more. I mean, one of the other um, projects that Monica definitely knows about is that I'm, helping the AJR do some research on uh, the impact of the Holocaust on Britain and mapping the results. So again, if you'd like to contact me, if you know somewhere that we should put on the map, like that hostel, mm. like the Sunshine Hostel, or uh, you know, a refugee club or whatever it might be, we want to map it to show how the effect of the Holocaust and the Nazis on Jews really could be spread throughout the whole of Britain, you know, there was probably somewhere down your street or in your neighbourhood who was a refugee or an exile or, you know, there might have been a refugee committee or club or something, you know, bringing that history very much onto your own doorstep. So that's also some very interesting research that I'm doing uh, at the moment, but plenty, plenty more to do. More than my lifetime, I think we'll we'll cope with. <laughs> You've done, You've done <laughs> pretty afraid. well. So anyway, do feel free if you write to the insiders outsiders email address that comes through to me, and then I can always forward uh, any emails to, to Mike. I'm sure he'll be very happy to. Okay, yeah, uh, absolutely be happy to. Um, very happy, more the merrier. Good. Um, perhaps I've I can, got, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry I just have to say I do have to go now. I'm afraid. So, Is that what you're uh, worried? Okay, in that case, Mike, I'll say a huge thank you. If the rest of you like you. to stay on just for a minute, because I just like to tell you about a few other related um, um, recordings that you might be interested in, Mike. With people thank you. Thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. Me. Hugely appreciate it. Bye bye. Bye and thank you. Uh, okay, lots of lots of thanks coming up. Please. Um, now, just just to say that um, obviously Mike couldn't include everybody and. In fact, the person I'm about to mention wasn't uh, involved with the kinder transport, but rather with the Windermere children that he also mentioned who came after the war as Holocaust survivors. But um, just to prove that actually there are other people also, I mean, Mike is obviously a linchpin figure, but lots, lots of other wonderful researchers who've been doing the research and indeed writing about some of these remarkable um, supporter figures. Mary Paneth, for example, at uh, Windermere, the Calgarth Estate, and Trevor Avery, who's the director of the wonderful Lake District Holocaust Project, has written a wonderful book about uh, called Rock the Cradle, which you might like to look out for. Um, and also just in terms of recordings, events that we've done in the past, insiders, outsiders, you might be interested to know, and again, I can include these in a follow-up email, but we did, in fact, Mike took part in a rather lovely event specifically looking at the role played by the Quakers, very much the unsung heroes. Um, we also, uh, I organized 
uh, a talk quite a long time ago now by the author of a novel about Proust, the remarkable Dutch woman he mentioned, and there's also the film that uh, is well worth looking out for. There's also a documentary film as well as a book about Wilfred Israel by an Israeli, young Israeli uh, director, which I can point you towards, etc., etc. So, you know, this is a hugely important and rich and still to some extent uh, un untold story. So, so I'll, yes, I'll hope that you'll sort of continue researching or sort of pursuing this. And just last but not least, um, Bertha Bracey, who's clearly absolutely central to the Quaker endeavor. There's a lovely statue dedicated to her memory, specifically talking about her role in helping children by, well, it's actually in Friends House, the, the meeting house, the, the headquarters of the Quakers in, in um, Euston Road. Um, but it's particularly poignant because it's actually by Naomi Blake, who herself was a Holocaust survivor and became a well-known sculptor after the war. So it all comes together in very, very touching ways, as I'm sure you will agree. Lovely. So I suspect no more questions. Time for supper. Thank you very, very much for listening in. And uh, if technology has gone right, which I think it has, the recording will be available on the Inside is Outside is YouTube channel very shortly. So good night, everyone, and thank you for joining us. All the best. Bye.